Next, a special report on key election issues involving science, a look at hydraulic fracturing or fracking, and why opponents want it banned. The drought and Proposition 1, how would the bond measure change California's water landscape? And genetically engineered food, the technology behind it, and debate over the labels on it. Science at the Ballot Box, a joint report from KQED Newsroom and KQED Quest. Good evening and welcome to Science at the Ballot Box, an election special produced by KQED Newsroom and KQED Sciences Series Quest. I'm Tui Vu. We start tonight with a focus on a controversial oil and gas extraction technique, hydraulic fracturing, also known as fracking. It uses high pressure water, sand and chemicals, breaking up rock to increase the flow of oil and gas. While California has been producing oil and gas for years, fracking itself is not yet widely used. But questions about its environmental impact have triggered calls to ban it here. Lauren Summer of KQED Science went to San Benito County, where the issue is going before voters. This story first aired in July. California's San Benito County is probably best known for its Spanish mission, a location for the classic Hitchcock film, Vertigo. Today, just around the corner from the famous church, a different kind of drama is unfolding. A grassroots group called San Benito Rising has started to campaign against hydraulic fracturing, also known as fracking. The group has put an initiative on the November ballot that asks San Benito voters to ban the oil and gas extraction technique. Cynthia Ponce opposes fracking because it uses large amounts of water. The misuse of water in a drought time is the big issue, you know. Even some of the farmers and the farm workers around here are very concerned about that because that means jobs. Even though San Benito produces little oil and none of it through fracking, it's the first county in California to qualify an anti-fracking initiative. And it's leading a trend of local California communities fighting to ban the practice. Are you paying attention, Governor Brown? Ban fracking and related hydraulic drilling in all of California now. Environmental groups have called for a moratorium or ban on fracking in California. Governor Jerry Brown's decision in 2013 to allow fracking to continue prompted the San Benito group to take action, says Mary Shaw Coron. We decided let's go to the people. Working with uh, politicians sometimes is very challenging. And uh, so that's why we decided the initiative process would be the way. Her message is resonating in a county where agriculture is a $300 million business. It takes as much water to frack one oil well in California as it does to grow, say, one acre of raspberries. Rancher Sally Calhoun worries that fracking could pollute wells or compete for scarce water during this third year of drought. The river has been dry for over a year. It should have been running. This winter, there was only enough grass for 700 cows, not the 2,000 that usually feed on Calhoun's ranch. It's very obvious right now that water is the most precious thing that we have in San Benito County. So I have personally supported the initiative with money, with funding. Fracking in California has mainly been confined to some oil fields in Kern County, the state's top oil producer. Widespread fracking in many other states has led to booms in oil and natural gas production. There, gas and oil are being extracted from a kind of rock called shale, where fuel is tightly stored. This rock looks like a layer in a cake and extends for miles, so producers drill horizontally to access as much of it as possible from a single well. Then they pump water mixed with sand and chemicals at high pressure to fracture the rock. U.S. Geological Survey hydrologist Bert Thomas is developing an easy way to find traces of these fracking fluids. And the methane value is 1.982. They all have at their basis a gelling agent so that it can hold the sand when it sits in place. And then they add another compound to make the jello collapse. And when the jello collapses, it leaves the sand behind. The sand provides a conduit for oil or gas. Fracking chemicals, as well as the water naturally mixed in with the oil, also flow to the surface and are captured. 
Maybe they'll put it into tanks, or maybe they'll put it into trucks. And in doing that, there are many opportunities for a mistake or a leak to occur above somebody's fresh groundwater resource, and that presents a risk. The HBO documentary Gasland Part 2 documents cases of water wells contaminated with chemicals. The tests weren't released to the public. I had to drive out there and get them myself. A 2013 screening in Santa Cruz moved Mary Shaw Coron to ask director Josh Fox for advice. So what he told us is that regulations don't really protect you. You have to stop it. But Governor Jerry Brown favors regulation over a ban. He signed a law in 2013 that calls for state agencies to create regulations by 2015 based on the results of a series of studies. I signed a bill that is requiring uh, not one but two uh, scientific uh, studies, deep studies, on the effects of fracking, on water, on seismic activity, on air, on land use. The USGS's Thomas hopes the state will come up with tough rules. The first line of defense in California is the regulation of the well construction. If the wells are built properly, then the risks to groundwater are minimized. The second thing would be regulations involving fluid handling at the surface. While the rules are finalized, companies must obtain a state permit and test groundwater if neighbors request it. Geologists like Don Gautier wonder whether a boom in fracking in California is even likely, given its unique geology. I think any, any reasonable analysis would have to, have to recognize there's a huge amount of uncertainty there. California has the same type of oil-rich shale rock as places like North Dakota. But California's Monterey shale has been producing that oil all along. These organic rich shales, they've been fractured, they've been shaken by earthquakes, they've been faulted. They very effectively have generated this oil and the oil has been expelled from the source rock, migrated up into these big traps and been produced now in California for 125 years or more. The question is how much, if any, oil remains behind in those source rocks? It is completely reasonable to think that most of the producible, that is the actual recoverable oil, has already been expelled and migrated away somewhere. California's geology is so complex that the Department of Energy recently slashed by 96% its projection of how much of the state's shale oil might be recoverable. But big oil companies say they still see potential for fracking in California. Does that look like a good location for you guys? Yeah. Meanwhile, some small producers have their own concerns about San Benito's anti-fracking ballot measure. The initiative also calls for a ban on two other oil extraction techniques commonly used across the state. The impact of this initiative on our project would be devastating. Armin Nahabedian's company, Citadel Exploration, has drilled the first of up to 15 exploratory wells in southern San Benito County to see how much oil is there. My project, when fully developed, could bring uh, significant tax revenue to the county, upwards of $3 million a year. The project is using a method called cyclic steam injection. About half of oil in California is extracted with similar methods, designed to heat up oil that's too thick to flow. You take a single well bore, inject steam into it for two weeks, you then let that steam soak in ground, and then you put that well back on the pump and start to produce it back. If the initiative were to pass, Citadel wouldn't be able to move from exploration to production. This is an absolute anti-hydrocarbon initiative. It's attempting to outlaw all methods of oil extraction, not only fracking, but a number of other means of just well stimulating. It is a threat to the oil industry. I admit it that it probably is, if you are an investor, that that is a problem. But we feel that it is time to really start moving very significantly off of fossil fuel. We can have a much brighter future. Alternative energy is technologically ready to be used. I think the only barrier is political at this point. But most transportation is still fueled by petroleum, and the state imports 60% of its crude oil from Alaska and countries like Iraq. I served in Operation Iraqi Freedom. I say very simply, and some people say very crudely, that you can drill for it or you can kill for it, but that's just the truth. So 
I prefer that we drill for it here. San Benito's 42,000 voters will get their chance to decide if they agree in November. That story was produced by Gabriela Quiros. Inspired by San Benito's example, groups in Mendocino and Santa Barbara counties have put similar initiatives before voters this fall. Well, moving on now from oil to water. As one of the worst droughts in the state's history drags on, Californians will decide on Proposition 1. If passed, the measure would authorize more than $7 billion in new bonds to pay for projects ranging from new reservoirs to watershed protection and water recycling. Supporters say the proposition is needed to boost and protect the state's water supply. Critics worry about the impact of building new dams and question how the measure would provide drought relief. Joining me with analysis is Ellen Hannock, a senior fellow at the Public Policy Institute of California, a nonpartisan think tank based in San Francisco. Welcome to the program, Ellen. Thank you. Well, as we said, Prop 1 would authorize $7.5 billion in uh, bonds for water-related projects. How would that money be used specifically? So a big chunk of it would go toward water supply projects, about half, I think we calculated, and a, a large component would be for storage projects. And that can be both surface storage, so new reservoirs, and also for groundwater storage, which means projects to help you store water underground in aquifers. And about uh, $1.5 billion for uh, watershed protection and restoration as well? That's right. And then there's funding for different kinds of local projects, supporting things like um, you know, re recycling, potentially desalination, conservation, different types of support for conservancies, habitat, a big mix. But by far the biggest chunk would go for water storage projects, dams and the such. Uh, and that is also the most controversial part of this bond. That is correct. But what, what is the challenge of building new dams and why, much, why so much controversy over it? So the controversy is really about using state dollars, state taxpayer dollars for building new dams. Um, in fact, over the last few decades, we have built at the local level some new reservoirs. Both here in the Bay Area, we built the Los Vaqueros Reservoir that's in Contra Costa County, and down in Southern California, they built Diamond Valley Lake. Those are projects that are funded locally for urban water supply systems so that they can, to help them get through droughts like this. The controversy is about putting taxpayer dollars into large projects that would be used for the state water project, the Central Valley project, supporting agriculture as well as cities. You focused on water issues for a long time. How do Californians get their water? It's, it's, we take it for granted, but it's a rather complicated system. It is, and the answer to that really depends on exactly where you live. So if you live here in San Francisco, where we're sitting now, your water actually comes from Yosemite National Park, and it travels a long way to get here. Um, if you're living in the East Bay, your water comes from further up in that watershed, but also up in the Sierras. And if you live in Santa Clara Valley, your water probably comes from Northern California and it makes its way through the Delta before it gets to you. And so then, an agriculture actually uses 80% of the water. So you, what we've talked about is That's this right. residential usage, but agriculture eats up a lot of it. It does. Well, agriculture in California, California is the biggest agricultural state in the country. We are you know, fantastic producers of fruits and vegetables and nuts and all kinds of things. We have really good soils, we have great sunshine, but in order to produce agriculture here, you really do need to add water because the summer is dry. So we've got a lot of water demand. Uh, why do supporters think this water bond is needed and why do opponents uh, not want it? So I would say there are more supporters than opponents at this point because this was a bond that was put on the ballot by the legislature and it passed with very strong bi bipartisan support. So you have really support at the political leadership level from both parties. You have support from a lot of the groups that care about water sort of at the, at the state and national level, including environmental groups and water agencies and so on, cities and counties. The opposition is coming more from some smaller environmental groups and some, some sports fishing groups and some folks in, in the Delta who are concerned, I think, about the amount of money that's available for storage. And I think folks in the Delta are also concerned about whether there's any way in which that could help make the, the governor's tunnel projects more likely. Does this bond affect the Delta? 
the bond has a little bit of money for the delta. Um, it has much less money than what a, a previous bond proposal had. So I think it's about $135 million for the delta ecosystem. So that's a small share of the total. The bond also has money for delta levies to support the, the agricultural activities there. Um, but most of the money is really for other things. The state hasn't built any new dams in more than 30 years. Uh, what kind of impact do you think the new dams would have on our water supply compared to other efforts like, for example, water conservation? D does it make sense to pour so much money into dams? So, you know, back up maybe and, and, and just keep track of sort of where we've been putting state money. Um, in the 2000s, between 2000 and 2006, voters approved almost $20 billion for water bonds and none of that money went to storage. That went, a lot of that money went to the ecosystem and watersheds, but a lot also went to projects like conservation, recycling, various ways to stretch available supplies and to add to new supplies. So this bond has more for water supply than some of those earlier ones, but it's really kind of continuing on with more for some of these more local projects. The new thing is that it does also have money for storage. And Water experts look at this and typically think that you need a mix. There's no silver bullet, really, in terms of the options. Will Prop 1 do anything, though, to ease the impact of the current drought? No, and that's because it takes time to build these new projects and undertake these investments. So nothing immediate to uh, ease uh, what we're seeing now in the state, but certainly a long-term remedy if it is approved by voters in the fall. It could help us get ready for the next drought. All right, Ellen, thank you. Ellen Hennick was is with the Public Policy Institute of California. And we turn our attention now to a food fight in the November election. Two years ago, Californians shot down a ballot measure to require the labeling of foods containing genetically engineered ingredients, also known as GMOs. With hundreds of products containing GMOs on supermarket shelves already, groups in Colorado and Oregon are putting labeling measures before voters next month. Advocates say they've cooked up their election strategies around lessons learned in California. KQED Science Senior Editor Andrea Kissick narrates this report. To know, we all have a right to know if our food is GMO. Are you voting yes on Proposition 37? In 2012, California's labeling initiative, Prop 37, started out with widespread support. But advocates like Consumer Reports' Elisa Odebashian then watched it lose by a small margin. The California ballot measure didn't pass for a number of reasons. Uh, one was low voter turnout. Uh, one was that the supporters didn't focus enough attention uh, in rural parts of the state. Farming is very important to our local economy and Prop 37 is bad for farmers. The California ballot initiative allowed for citizen lawsuits that could be brought by anybody at any time, and there was a lot of concern that this would uh, be a, a boon for trial lawyers. And then let the trial lawyers sue us just by claiming that the wrong wording was used on the label. There have been a lot of limits placed on citizen lawsuits in the Oregon ballot initiative. In November, Oregon and Colorado will vote on their own labeling measures. Supporters hope those states will follow Vermont's lead. A law signed in April 2014 makes Vermont the first state to mandate labeling and is part of a nationwide effort by labeling advocates. The strategy is to pass labeling laws state by state by state until finally uh, Congress decides that the groundswell of support for labeling is there, and then they pass it. Consumers have a right to know if their food is, has undergone this process, because it changes the food. Just as pasteurized food, just as homogenized food, from concentrate, from frozen, they're all labeled, because a process has been done to those foods that changes them materially. In Oregon's campaign, food manufacturer representatives like Dana Bieber have argued that labeling would increase food costs. Well, of course the costs are going to go up. The cost isn't in the relabeling. I mean, that's, that's a nominal cost. The cost to the consumer comes from the fact that food companies will have to remake their food with higher priced non-GE ingredients in void, to avoid having to put this label on it. But as the political battles continue, biologists are using genetic engineering as one more tool to improve crops. 
Engineering allows them to change crops in more precise ways than conventional plant breeding. Classical breeding basically involves taking the female eggs from one plant and bringing them together with the male parts of another plant. Uh, and then all that genetic information gets mixed up. With genetic engineering, it's just moving very small parts of that genetic information and pulling it out in a very precise way and then pasting it back into another plant. At the University of California, Berkeley, biologist Peggy Lameau is genetically engineering a cereal called sorghum. 300 million people in Africa eat sorghum porridge every day and often little else. But sorghum is difficult to digest. So with initial funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Lameau is tweaking a gene in sorghum seed so that it produces 20 times more of a protein that makes the plant more digestible. Many people in developing countries don't have markets that they can go to and, you know, pick out this vegetable, that vegetable, and get all their vitamins and minerals that way. They basically eat one or two things. Part of our effort then was to increase digestibility. In the mid-1990s, the Missouri-based seed company Monsanto was the first to sell genetically engineered seeds. Monsanto genetically engineered one category of crops to fend off agricultural pests. They designed a second category of engineered crops that could resist their Roundup herbicide. The idea was to kill the weeds, but not the crops, when Roundup was sprayed. With these new Roundup-ready soybeans and other crops, farmers could more easily use Roundup herbicide, which was cheaper and less toxic than other herbicides. Today, about 90% of the sugar beets, cotton, corn, and soybeans grown in the United States are genetically engineered. Organic farmers like West Marin's Albert Strauss don't use genetically modified seeds or ingredients. They fear that engineered feed will mix in with their organic feed, and they oppose engineered crops that encourage the use of synthetic pesticides. Pesticides, herbicides are not sustainable. They're not healthy for land and they're not healthy for people and cows. So if you're not buying organic, what genetically engineered foods might you find at the supermarket? Some soybeans, corn, and sugar beets end up in snack food, soda, and cereals. A little yellow crookneck squash and zucchini, some varieties of Hawaiian papayas, and some sweet corn are genetically engineered to resist pests. <laughs> and 20 years ago, scientists also engineered a tomato, this time to satisfy the consumer's palate. The Flavor Saver was created in Davis by a biotech company called Calgene. The goal was a tasty tomato that would remain firm for transportation. The tomato was labeled and popular, but it wouldn't stay firm on the vine, and the venture was short-lived. The tomato was important because it was the first genetically engineered food to be taken to the FDA for approval, says Belinda Martineau, who worked on the project. The company wanted to show the tomato was safe. That was the bottom line. Oftentimes, using this technology, a dozen genes or, or half a dozen genes will be inserted at various places um, in the tomato genome or any plant genome. So the potential there was that the gene could land in a tomato gene and disrupt it, thereby mutating it. Genetic alterations could, for example, lead to a spike in unwanted plant chemicals that could cause health problems. So biologists look in each plant to see if any genes were disrupted. If anything looks odd or different or looks like it might have an issue, then we don't use those plants. So we choose those that we're confident that they're not going to cause changes uh, to the food quality or the food safety. But labeling advocates say that if an allergen were ever released, there wouldn't be a way to trace it unless genetically engineered foods were labeled. Without labeling, they will have no way of knowing or tracing their negative health impact to the food they're eating. The World Health Organization and the U.S. National Academies have stated that the genetically engineered foods available today are safe to eat. I have personally gone through the safety studies that are available to look at uh, on the crops that are out there now. Uh, and my conclusion was from looking at those that I did not see any indication that there were 
health safety issues associated in a specific way with any genetically engineered food or crop that's out there now. Companies that sell genetically engineered seeds in the United States need approval from the EPA and USDA for most seeds. They also regularly go before the FDA, though that process is voluntary, which has drawn criticism. We think that's not enough. We think an unbiased governmental body should be looking at the safety of these foods before they uh, reach the marketplace. From the studios of Vermont Public Television. In Vermont, the Grocery Manufacturers Association is suing the state over its new labeling law. Reporter Emerson Lynn says food companies fear losing customers. What concerns the, the manufacturers, the grocery people, is that you're going to have people walking into grocery stores and you've got the people who are labeling uh, their products GMO and then non-GMO, uh, which invites people who haven't really paid a lot of attention to the issue to wonder whether or not one's better than the other. With the threat of similar lawsuits looming, Oregon and Colorado will vote on labeling this November. And in Northern California, genetically engineered foods are on the ballot, but with a different focus. Measure P in Humboldt County would ban the growing of genetically engineered crops, although it would not affect the sale of foods containing those ingredients. For more election coverage, including our guide to ballot initiatives, go to kqd.org slash election. That is it for tonight. Thanks so much for watching, and remember to vote if you haven't already. I'm Twee Boo. Have a good night. Support for science programming is provided by these generous contributors.